present my project App into History. And first I will explain the structure of the project and the concept of the application. And then I will focus on the study results. So on user types and types of historical narrations. <clears throat> the project App into History is quite complex because several institutions are involved. Um, there is the Teacher Training Commission, Qualis NRW, the Archive of the Bodelschwing Foundation, Bethel in Bielefeld, Paderborn University, and several school classes. Um, first, we developed the application like a prototype for it, then we tested it and adapted it, and then we implemented it the application in school classes. And I'm not only developed the application, but also conducted um, empirical studies about user behavior in the application, first with university students and then with high school students. So, um, yeah, what is the idea behind the concept of the application? I will explain this with history textbooks and they are um, structured like this. So first, there's an introduction text um, about the historical topic. Then there are historical sources, and then there are tasks for the students. And um, the tasks here are about analyzing and interpretation of the historical source. And um, But if you take a deeper look to this, you can see that there's no need to analyze or interpret the historical source because you only have to read the text at the beginning and to repeat it or rephrase it because there, there is already the solution. You don't have to think by your own. And this, this is not only the case for one history textbook, but um, you can see in several empirical studies about history textbooks that the main part of the tasks aim only at reproduction and reorganization. And that like, um, tasks that require a reflexive approach to the required knowledge and methods, or that ask learners to make independent interpretations and evaluations in the context of historical re- and deconstruction processes are strongly underrepresented. So this is a huge problem, but also if you take a look to history classes, um, you can see a lot of um, yeah problems and um, as it was pointed out in several empirical studies. For example, in a lesson, um, learners usually work with historical sources for less than 10 minutes, and the most elementary criteria of source criticism are often disregarded. Um, and source selection is often streamlined and not multi-perspectivity, multi-perspective, and this leads to a historical narration pre-constructed by the teachers, uh, yeah, or like before you could see um, by school books. The result is a largely affirmative or positivistic approach to historical sources. And all this is in great contrast to uh, what should or what historical thinking and historical learning is meant to be. And you can <clears throat> um, yeah, see this in the empiric, uh, in the disciplinary matrix according to Jan Rusen. So historical thinking should start with interests. So um, questions in the present about the past, and then you need to have ideas how you can answer these questions. So you need to think about how can I find historical sources or materials? Um, what sources should I select? Then you need to analyze these sources, and then you can answer the questions in form of a historical narration. And normally, we know this all, oh, there are not, it's not only one narration, but there are a lot of different narrations and historic, historians discuss these. But this is not the case in school classes. And often it is said that this is too difficult for history students or high school students. Um, but we have also a lot of projects when students cooperate with archives. And there we can see that such a learning process is possible and that it is not too difficult for students. So the idea of an app into history is to provide students um, such a learning process and to that they can cooperate with archives in the digital space and also um, use the potentials of the digital space. 
So in the Apple to History, students develop their own historical topic and questions. They can search for historical sources, analyze and interpret them, and then write their own narration and present this and discuss it in the classroom. Um, and in the heart of the application, they have the cooperation with um, an archive or yeah, an institution. And um, for my um, empirical study, I cooperated with the Betel archive in Bielefeld, and therefore I created also a special module in the application, which I call Story Mode Betel. So the app into history is an educational platform. So it is browser-based and you don't have to download it. And the structure is modular. So there are several institutions um, who could be or are part of the application and they can upload materials, so historical sources in several digital archives or create their own digital archive um, for the application. And there are also different tasks, which could be like task in story mode or in basic mode. And um, hist uh, history teachers can then create um, their digital learning rooms in the application um, individually for their uh, students. And they can choose between digital archives. They can combine archives and they can choose between different tasks. <clears throat> yeah, so in the application, every class has um, their, its own um, room and space. And in that room, um, uh, students work together in, in small groups and um, like uh, consisting of uh, two to four people. And then they can use um, every tool in the application collaboratively and cooperatively. And um, first there is a research logbook. Um, there you can find the different tasks. There's a news feed. Um, there you can see what your uh, team members um, yeah, uh, uh, did uh, like in the last uh, few <laughs> um, uh, days. Then there is a digital archive. There you can search for historical sources. You can select sources and then transfer them into a digital timeline. There you can analyze the sources with uh, digital annotations. And um, then you can write your historical narration in the journal and you can combine the journal with elements from the timeline. So with digital sources and the annotations. Um, there are also several um, hints and context information on every page in the application, but there's also a wiki um, where students can search for yeah, historical context or research methods. <clears throat> so for the beta module, I designed a special research assignment. So um, the beta module starts with a debate in the city council of Bielefeld. And um, there are um, two political parties discuss um, about uh, a new street in Beta. So the Christian Democratic Union wants to name the street after Friedrich von Bodelschwing, um, the uh, yeah, former president of the Bodelschwing Foundation during the Nazi time. And the Greens are against this. They want to name the street after Elisabeth Philipp. Um, she was a victim of the NS euthanasia. And um, in that debate in the city council, the um, yeah, parties can't decide what to do, so they uh, commission historians to um, write an export report about that issue and um, to decide if the new street should be named after Friedrich von Bodelschwing or Elisabeth Philipp. And um, students in the application take the role of these historians and start their project, their research project about the history of data. Um, this a debate in the city council is fictional, but behind this, there's a, an actual um, debate between historians and, and the public in the So it is about um, um, the it is about Friedrich von Bodelschwing and Bethe during the Nazi time. So there are several like narrations or narratives about this. So there are na uh, narrations um, which say there that in Betel there was no euthanasia and that Friedrich von Bodelschwing preserved um, 
euthanasia and but there are also other narrations and they tell the contrast so that in Beetle Be there was euthanasia and that Bodelschwing cooperated with um, the Nazis. And uh, students also have to deal with these different um, yeah, narrations and to find their own position in the de debate. Yeah, um, here you can see the research logbook. There are the different tasks and the steps. And the research logbook you know, students use um, for the for the planning of their research and to develop historical questions and like um, collect um, historical context information. Um, here you can see the digital archive. <clears throat> it is structured like the archive in Beta. So there are several signatures. If you click on one signature, then the field in the middle opens and there you can um, get like a, a few information about the file. In the next um, part, you can see the whole file and you can click through it and then select several pages of it. Um, because here where you see that little star, you can create um, like a favorites list and um, yeah, work with this pages and then in the other tools. Um, we have for the beta module or beta archive, digital archive, we um, uploaded 12 um, files and um, in total, these are a little bit more than uh, 800 pages. <clears throat> Here you can see the timeline and there you can analyze the historical sources. Um, you can put um, yeah, digital annotations on it and these are like little post-its. So you can like uh, put uh, yeah, colors on this and then these um, annotations are also combined with text fields where you can write your ideas, your questions or whatever on the digital source. And in the presentation mode of the timeline, you can present these, also um, the annotations. And if you are in the application, you can also click on the annotation and then you will see the text behind it. <clears throat> um, in the journal, there are several text fields um, like introduction, main part and conclusion. And um, students can write their historical narration collaboratively and then they can combine several elements of the timeline. Here it is um, yeah, a digital source with um, uh, also annotations and the text. And in the application, you can then export this as a PDF file, share your narration in the digital classroom and also discuss it, or you could also print it out. Okay, so this is quite um, perhaps a nice concept, but <laughs> it is also um, challenging for students, I would say. And so I also conducted an empirical study because I want to know how students use the application. So I conducted the preliminary study and the main study with um, uh, high school and university students. And um, in my study, I analyze not the individuals, but the groups. So every group is composed of three to four people or two to four people. And um, normally uh, students need for this uh, project four to six weeks. Um, so my research question is how do students use the, the app into history and how do they narrate history in the application? And um, um, the app in, is my learning material and also my survey instrument. And um, because I can uh, collect um, qualitative data, so every text the students write in the application, I can collect and I also uh, we implemented tracking in the application so I can collect quantitative data in form of log files. And to analyze these different data types, I used um, the qualitative content analysis um, uh, for the qualitative data and the quantitative data I analyzed via uh, log file analysis. So I used um, also different Python programs and um, k-means clustering to identify different user types. And also I used for the uh, qualitative data, um, I quantified these and then I also used um, k-means clustering to identify 
different types of historical narrations. Okay, I um, will first focus on the quantitative data and um, yeah, first explain what is clustering. So clustering is part of artificial intelligence applications, and this is part of machine learning. And um, if you if your data is not labeled and you want to find um, structures in the data, uh, this is part of uh, unsupervised learning, so clustering. Um, and this fits um, well to my um, research goals because I want to analyze the learning process to identify user types and types of historical narrations, but I can't like um, reach this process directly because I'm not in the classroom, but I can collect the data, um, like the traces students uh, leave in the application, and these are my data sets. But mm, you can imagine the data sets are quite complex because every click in the application, for example, is uh, um, documented in the log file, so that this is quite a large data set. So an algorithm can help me to identify structures in the data sets. But these structures are not yet user types or types of historical narrations. So an expert is needed to interpret these structures and to see if it's like possible to um, identify user types or types of historical narrations. Um, so for the log files, the data sets um, consists of uh, the time of use students spend in the application, the page views and the wizards. So in total and for the several tools I showed you before. And so this is an 18 dimensional um, space um, and for each of the 49 groups I analyzed. <clears throat> um, I used uh, k-means clustering because this is an all round algorithm, I would say, and um, it fits for different types of clusters and properties. It is um, robust even if the data sets differ, like you can imagine from user to user, and uh, it has a good scalability team, so it fits for uh, small and large data sets. Um, I implemented this with PyCarrot, which uses k-means implementation from scikit-learn. So uh, what does the algorithm do? Um, in the first step, um, uh, or the first step chooses the initial centuries and each sample is then assigned to its nearest century. And then um, in the next step or the next step creates new centuries by taking the mean value of all the samples assigned to each previous century. And then um, the difference between the old and the new centuries are computed and the algorithm repeats these steps until the centuries do not move circuit. So I use this for analyzing the log files and here you can see the result. Okay, <laughs> this is not so easy to see. So I, I uh, use this uh, image, uh, which is a little bit better. Um, here you can see that the algorithm identified five different clusters. So cluster zero to four and the question is now, are the, these different user types? So to um, uh, get an answer, you have to analyze the different dimensions in the, in the data sets, um, and I will show you some of them. So if you uh, analyze the total time users spend in the application, you can see that users of cluster one used the application in this dimension in a minimalistic way, I would say. Um, in comparison to groups of cluster three and four, because there you can see they use the app quite more intensively. And because of this, I call or I named uh, groups of cluster one, the minimalists, and groups of cluster three and four, the engaged and very engaged. Um, but also you can see that groups of clusters zero and two are very similar. So you have to find differences between these clusters in other dimensions. Now, for example, in the um, page views of the logbook, so the research logbook where the students um, start their research and plan it, you can see that groups of cluster zero use the research logbook here in the page views quite more intensively and groups of cluster four uh, two, not so much. So I name the 
proofs of cluster zero, the planners. And if you then analyze in the, um, the other dimensions, you can see that groups of cluster two use the timeline more intensively and also the journal. So I name the groups of cluster two the journalists. Um, <clears throat> my idea um, in the first place was that the archive would be very interesting and that there will be a lot of differences between the user types but it isn't. <laughs> so here you can see that the archive is used by every group quite intensively. There are also differences, but it is still a lot. So you can see that the maximum is like uh, 3000 page views and the minimum are 300, which is also for students a lot. Um, if you compare this with the number of sources in a textbook, it's quite uh, a high number. So you can, um, uh, yeah, I would say that the archive is the most crucial tool in the application and that students um, are very engaged here, you can see, and they um, also are motivated um, in the research in the archive. And this shows the potential of that tool. So um, here you can see students can um, uh, yeah, use an independent, open, individual, and at the same time, collaborative and historical learning tool. Um, yeah, so in the end, I could identify different user types. So first we have the minimalists, which use the app in a minimalistic way. And then we have the engaged and very engaged groups. And um, so they differ in um, the intensive use of the application in form of time visits and page views. Um, uh, on the other side, we have the planners and the journalists, and they differ in the different use of the tools. So the planners used the log file, uh, the research logbook at the beginning to start their project and to plan it. And the journalists used the timeline and the journal um, more intensively um, for to like write their historical narration. And here you can see that um, every tool is used in the application, but also in a different way. Yeah, so in, in my next step, I analyzed the qualitative data. So I analyzed the narrations and all the texts students wrote in the application and via uh, qualitative content analysis. And um, I focused on the different dimensions of historical narrations. So I analyzed how students deal with other narrations, um, like um, Wikipedia or narrations um, on the Betel website. And I analyzed if students reflect on this and if they um, um, get an idea of the controversy of, the, of these narrations. Um, also, I focused on um, uh, the dealing with sources. So what uh, sources uh, students select, if the sources are multi-perspective, and if they reflect um, about sources in a critical way. <clears throat> then I also uh, analyzed the positions uh, students take um, in the debate and if the narrations in the end are um, plural in, this, in the different classes. Um, I will focus now on the dealing with sources. So one part of this is the source critical reflection. Um, here you can see like parts um, of the text students wrote. And um, here is uh, the first one is um, like a type of uh, the source criticism about the type of source or the genre. Um, one group wrote, um, other families also received so-called comfort letters. Source 228 is a copy of a transcript of a letter to a man. Um, the address C and sender are not mentioned. However, the letter contains the same information as Elizabeth family received. The transfer of the patient in the case of a mother constituted a wartime measure. The asylum would only serve as a transit facility for the sick who were to be transferred to another asylum nearby. And now this is important, the sentences of the two sources are almost identical. Only the person and cause of death Differ. So here you can see the students um, 
analyze the source and they get an idea, okay, this is, is uh, an example for euthanasia because we have here like a comfort letter. And yeah, so this is quite an elaborate historical narration of students, I would say. Um, there are also um, source critical source reflections about author and historical context and so on. And I um, like analyzed these and then I um, these results I quantified and then I used also the k-means algorithm to identify in the same way as I showed before several um, types of historical narrations. And I found <laughs> these uh, types. So I found, as I showed before, like the type um, I, I would I want to name the source critiques. So they use sources overall in a critical way. I found groups that use multi-perspective sources and groups who only used sources to like um, write their narr narration, but it's a little bit more in a positivistic way, I would say. And um, then I also found groups with which um, deal overall with the narrations in the web. And I found groups I call the reflective or rounder. They are, I would say, the most elaborated um, groups because they reflected about historical narrations and sources in a critical way, and they um, wrote very elaborate narrations. So to sum up, I could identify different user types, so how students uh, use the application, and I also could identify different types of historical narrations. And if you compare these different um, types, you can see that there's no exclusive connection between user types and types of historical narrations, um, but you can see tendencies. So for example, um, the journalists are, um, are the uh, user types who um, are mostly a part of source critiques and reflective or rounder. And because of this, you can like um, adapt um, the application, application accordingly to these user types and types of historical narration. And it is also possible to create new modules for the different types. Um, yeah, and in total, I could, um, yeah, see that the app concept offers learners an open learning and um, research process and that here the most potential tool is the digital archive because it is like the first time for students that they can choose historical sources by their own and that they can understand that the source selection is an important part of the historical research process. And all this, um, um, you can see in the plural results in the narrations of the students. And this is also important because only if you have plural narrations, so different narrations in the classroom, you can reflect on this and you can discuss why are our narrations so different. And um, because we selected different sources or we interpret them in a different way. And this is quite important for the story learning. Thank you so much. <laughs> that is uh, yeah, my conclusion. And now I'm happy to discuss it with you.